Magic Spoon tastes exactly like your favorite childhood breakfast cereals, but it has no sugar, lots of protein. It's keto and low carb friendly. It's delicious without the guilt. Get five dollars off when you click my link below and use the promo code Pacman. Welcome, everybody. I want to start with something a little different today. Uh, a judge has rejected a plea deal for the killers of Ahmad Arbery which would have seen them spend a lot of their sentences in the much less severe conditions of federal custody rather than state prison. And this is really interesting because it relates to the way in which hate crime laws and sometimes really serious crimes can end up with people having an easier time serving their sentences. Now, but before even getting getting into the details, I want to preface this by saying I'm very much against the idea that there should be punishment above and beyond what's actually prescribed. Like one thing is we can talk about sentencing guidelines. Should you get X number of years or Y number of years if convicted of certain crimes? But as an example, oftentimes there are some even in my own audience who sort of take pleasure at the idea that those convicted of sexual assault in particular child sexual assault will receive punishment in prison from other prisoners in terms of violence and even rape above and beyond the sentence. For me, that's a failure of our prison system. If our prison system can't even keep people safe from other inmates, that's a failure. It's not something that I say they're really going to get what's coming to them because they're also going to be attacked or raped in prison. So that that I find that to be completely out of bounds and really an indictment of our prison system. But without a doubt, in general, inmates would rather spend time in federal custody rather than state prison. The conditions, generally speaking, are considered to be much less harsh and severe. And that came close to happening with Ahmad Arbery's killers. So let's look at this report from CNN. A federal judge Monday rejected the plea deal reached by prosecutors and Travis McMichael on hate crimes charges. So remember that they were convicted in Georgia. Travis McMichael, we're talking about here, convicted in Georgia on state crimes. And then there was also a federal case that is still in process, which includes hate crime charges. The agreement would have precluded his federal trial in the killing of Ahmad Arbery. Earlier, McMichael had agreed to plead guilty to a single hate crime charge, interference with rights, in exchange for prosecutors recommending he serve 30 years in federal prison. Under the agreement, the 36 year old McMichael would have been transferred from a state prison to federal custody. After completing the federal sentence, he would have been returned to Georgia to finish life in prison without parole. Five of the final years would have counted towards his supervised release from federal prison. U.S. District Judge Lisa Godby Wood said she was not comfortable with these guidelines and Arbery's family also opposed the deal. The judge has been expected to rule separate, had been expected to rule separately on the same plea deal for Gregory McMichael. But after the judge rejected Travis's deal, attorneys for both McMichaels asked for more time to decide whether to change their pleas to guilty. The hearing is next Friday. The family also was against this idea. Arbery's mother, Wanda Cooper Jones, was outraged by the proposal and felt betrayed by U.S. Justice Department lawyers. She told a state court judge uh, to give the Mike McMichaels what they deserve life in prison and urged Wood not to accept the deal. Quote, please listen to me. Granting these men their preferred conditions of confinement would defeat me. It gives them one last chance to spit in my face after murdering their son. And as uh, as it says here, um, these are often called country clubs, these federal prisons. They have better funding. They're, quote, generally more accommodating. Um, this is one of those cases where you and we, we have to see what ultimately happens. This deal has been rejected. We have to see uh, until something is accepted. We, we need to wait before we really comment. This is sort of the opposite of what hate crimes are supposed hate crime laws are supposed to do. They did a worse crime. It was motivated by racial hate, racial animus, racism, one might say. And for them to end up doing easier time in federal prison defeats the point of these hate crime laws. Now, your reaction might be, David, this is why hate crime laws don't make sense. That's a different argument. And I do believe that when there is 
a motivation for a crime that goes above and beyond the individual, but rather to their membership in a certain group or class, be it based on race or national origin or um, ethnicity or whatever the case may be uh, of sexual orientation. There is something more insidious about that because it's a crime not only against the individual, but it's a warning uh, to others who are members of that group if their membership in the group was a factor in the crime. So for, for me, the issue here is not that hate crime laws exist, although I know some in my audience disagree with me. But this is an issue of very specific negotiations where first you've got the state trial and you have a verdict and you have a sentence. And then later to say, wow, this crime is so bad that there's also a federal case, but the federal case actually leads to a less severe punishment. That seems backwards. And so I'm glad that the judge rejected this plea deal. It wouldn't make sense to say your crime is so bad that we're also charging you federally, but you're going to get to do 30 years in a country club rather than in state prison. I'm all for reforming state prison. I'm all for reforming sentencing guidelines, all of it. But when the crime is so serious that you have state and federal charges, you shouldn't end up with a less severe punishment thanks to having a federal case. So we're going to continue uh, watching it and we'll see ultimately what is accepted. I'm curious to hear from you about this one. Uh, we have seen over the last four years, decade, 15 years, almost pick, pick your time frame. Um, much of the American right wing riddled with projection, projection where they claim the left is doing that which they are actually doing. So one example is the right loves to say we are for free speech and the left is against free speech. And in reality, it's often the truth that the right is for free speech only in their very narrow view for as long as it's convenient to them, and then they are very quickly against it. They don't care about free speech once it's no longer convenient to them. Social media regulation is a great example of this. As soon as the lion's share of covid disinformation is coming from the right, they're no longer OK letting Twitter or YouTube or Facebook decide what's OK on their platform. They want to uh, mandate that these platforms allow covid disinformation. Now, on the other side of that, they claim to be against business regulation there. That's a principle. We are against regulating businesses until Twitter is banning the people they want to ban from Twitter. And all of a sudden they say we need to regulate Twitter to force them to allow certain speech. You guys understand this concept. The principle is abandoned as soon as it's inconvenient. So along these lines, there's this topic of of books and banning books. And they claim the left wants to ban books that are inconvenient to them. Uh, that being said, I've heard nothing about wanting to ban Bobby Kennedy Jr.'s anti vaccine, anti Dr. Fauci book or whatever other book. What what we want and speaking for myself, I want to educate people so they never fall for buying these dumb books in the first place. But this is not about me. Because now there's a rash of right wingers wanting to ban and in some cases succeeding at banning all sorts of books from all over the place, often under the guise of protecting kids. That's the explanation that they will often give a few examples of this. A Tennessee school board has voted unanimously to ban the Pulitzer Prize winning book Mouse. This is about the Holocaust in cartoon form. Some of you emailed me about this. They want to ban it from their eighth grade curriculum. They say it has objectionable language and nudity, cartoon nudity, of course. And there's similar campaigns underway in all sorts of other uh, districts in more than 30 states at this point. State line has been investigating this and they will often say these books are pornographic merely because they depict an LGBTQ experience, sometimes a black character with an LGBTQ experience. Uh, Huffington Post, HuffPost now it's called, reports that in Texas, the Republican governor, Greg Abbott, is uh, sort of taking advantage of this effort to pull, quote, pornographic or obscene books from school libraries after Republican Representative Matt Krause circulated a list of 800 books that he believes crosses the line. And the vast majority of these books were written by women or people of color or LGBTQ 
writers, according to the Dallas Morning News. So consider how many of their own supposed principles they are violating here. They are for free speech, but they've got a long list of books that they want to ban. They are for doing what's best for people, yet they're not letting education experts, the teachers decide, is this book a good teaching tool for my students or not? They are deciding from above the elected officials, that is. And the reasons that they give for banning most of these books should actually apply to the Bible. But of course, the Bible is always OK. Uh, murder in the Bible, incest, genocide, sexual content. It's all in the Bible. But the Bible is beyond reproach. That's a sacred cow. So putting all of this aside, a great way to get kids interested in a lot of these books is to ban them. I mean, I, I I'm against the book banning on principle, of course, but I also recognize that banning these books might get kids interested in, in, in the books as well. The urge to do something you're not supposed to do can sort of end up being like an adrenaline adrenaline rush. But that being said, uh, many of these books can easily be read online, but it is it is again an example of it, it's really one of the major stories of conservatism. It's not even conservatism of reactionary right thinking of the last era of this era, which is our prince. Nothing is more important than our principles. Of course, our principles are sacred until the outcome of those principles is inconvenient when it comes to speech, when it comes to censorship, when it comes to regulation, when it comes to elections at the end of the day. And this is just the latest example. Let me know if this is going on in your state, in your locality. You can find me on Twitter at D Pacman. It is a brand new year. Maybe you have goals around getting in better shape, maybe cutting back on sugar. That's why you should check out our longtime sponsor, Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon tastes exactly like the delicious, sweet breakfast cereals you loved as a kid. But Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 14 grams of protein and only four net carbs. So it's perfect if you're doing low carb or keto or if, like me, you just try to limit your sugar intake, you can build your own variety pack with flavors like cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, cinnamon, cookies and cream, waffle, maple, blueberry. That's my favorite. Magic Spoon lets you enjoy a sweet, delicious snack without the guilt. You can stick to your goals and still treat yourself. And if you don't love Magic Spoon as much as I do, They'll give you all of your money back. No questions asked. Magic Spoon is giving my audience five dollars off when you go to magic spoon dot com slash Pacman and use the promo code Pacman. Remember that the David Pacman show is primarily funded by viewers and listeners like you, people who watch clips on YouTube or listen to the podcast, listen on our various radio affiliates or even watch on free speech TV. You can sign up and get a membership cheap, very cheap at joinpacman.com. You can also use the coupon code WOW22 to get a discount, if you please. Not means tested, available to everybody. Sign up at joinpacman.com. All right, so we had two correspondents at the Trump rally over the weekend in Conroe, Texas. We had Luke Beasley down there and we had Josh Pitt, and these guys did a fantastic job. We're going to look at some of these videos now. This is the worst of the worst of what we suspected was going on at these rallies in terms of the people. I put together some questions for Luke and Josh. You can find, by the way, if you go to YouTube and search for Luke Beasley, Luke has a YouTube channel. Uh, make sure to subscribe. He's really doing a great job. Uh, so let's start. I mean, let's let's just jump right into it. Um, the first guy that Luke spoke to um, admitted to going to the Capitol on January 6, 2021. I Plain and simple. Let's just jump right into it and uh, account for the fact that there's a, there's background noise. It was a wild and raucous situation. Uh, some of the audio is not perfect, but the guys did the best job they could. Here is one guy saying, "I was at the Capitol on January 6th. So you're here at Trump rally. What are you hoping to hear from when he's on stage? You know, I just want to. I hope we have a plan to get this, uh, get our republic back. That's what I'm here for. I'm trying to find my son. He's in this big crowd here. We were uh, in Washington on January 6th with two million patriots. Now, of course, there were not. First of all, there. I would argue that they're not patriots. But that putting that aside, there were not two million people in Washington on January 6th. That's widely known now. 
and I'm happy to be here. I walked about three miles to get to this field. Imagine walking three miles to go to a Trump rally. Dang, tell me you didn't yeah. go from the rally to the Capitol. The Lieutenant uh, Governor I of did. Texas, I did. Dan Patrick. To the Capitol? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's crazy. No, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a great day until the end. <laughs> Hmm. For yeah, sure. So there is a guy who admits that he went to the Capitol. Um, two of the questions that I told the guys we should really ask are ask people what they think about critical race theory. And then if they say they're whatever they say about it, then ask them what is critical race theory. I also told them to ask about socialism. It's basically as good as we could have imagined. Um, they're very much against critical race theory and they don't know what it is. Here's Josh Pitt talking to the first guy. And again, I know there's background audio. We, sh we I, I think we can still make out what's being said here. The questions are, what do you think about critical race theory? What is critical race theory? Think about critical race theory. Not a fan. Not a fan. What is critical race theory? Not what I'm going to say. OK. What do you think of critical race theory? I'm not a fan. What is critical race theory? Not what I'm a fan of. None of them know what it is. Shouldn't surprise us. Here's another one. Gotcha. Are you concerned with critical race theory? Absolutely. It's got to go. Do you think Not it's being for young taught children. It could be taught. Huh? No, yeah, it is being taught. And some, in some schools, some schools are fighting it. So it's not there yet. But sure. I can guarantee you around the United States, it's in the schools at a very young age. And it's very sad. Okay. It's very sad. So it's terrible that it's being taught, including to kids at a young age. Uh, it, it will change that's whole country. What is critical race theory? What is critical race theory? Critical race theory is a lot of things. Mm. I've not done a lot of research on it, but there's a lot of things in it. The uh, total race baiting uh, teachings, the, uh, help me out with uh, the uh, LGB qua, I can't even say it because I'm just- LGB qua, that's interesting. I have never heard critical race theory be called LGB qua, but I mean, listen, uh, this, this is someone who is very much against it. That, that thing. Don't worry. Yeah, they're teaching sex education to the kids. I mean, there's just all kinds of stuff. Now, sex education has nothing to do with critical race theory, but I'm sure you guys know that. With it. I'm, I'm not good on that because I can't, like, give okay. it, but yes. Okay. Um, then there were a lot of people, <laughs> this is something, huh? A lot of people furious with Mike Pence. Um, and in fact, we are now looking at a guy holding a sign that says, execute Pence for treason. Uh, let's listen a little bit here. He could have stopped it. He could have stopped it. Stop what? The fraudulent Kanye overtake. But I know that according to the Pence Constitution, Obama claims to be executed in the public square. So what just happened is this guy is holding a sign that says execute Pence. And then another guy yells that Clinton should be executed in a public square. This law and order people don't care about due process. Go figure. Everybody to see. Are you okay being on camera? Against against the great country. God bless. Go. Bless. God. Hell yeah, brother. You about that. Are you concerned? He needs to be. He's okay. So now we move on to my next question, which is, is Joe Biden a socialist or communist? And I made sure that the guys know if they say yes, you've got to ask what are the socialist or communist policies? And again, it's exactly what we expected. He needs to be in prison Sorry. or hung like back in the day. But, you know, oh. that that rule has kind of changed. <laughs> well, <that's laughs> time, you know. it's squad. Hey, you want to oh, sorry. And we need to we need to actually move up to the. Uh, so the communism part is just a, a few a moment ahead here. Uh, OK, here we go. Uh, finding my there's just so much here. Oh my gosh. Wow. So do you think Joe Biden is communist? Yes. 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 Based He's so on, up in the China is not even funny. So based on what policy that he supports, would you consider to be communist? What, what do you mean? Say that again? <laughs> Isn't that the best? On the basis of which policy is Joe Biden a communist? Sorry, what do you mean? Well, it's kind of the key question, ma'am. Are there any policies that he's enacted or supported 
Since well, he supports China, and that just sums it all up, I guess. Supports mm. China. Okay, so... The China president. The China... Oh. Not the Chinese people that are being brutalized and hurt. No. Gotcha. He supports gotcha. the Chinese. He's been in their pockets, and that's not going to change. And then, so this woman thinks Biden's a communist because he supports China. Communist China. <laughs> I believe so. So this now we've got another guy. And if you're not watching, this guy is wearing full Trump regalia. It's a, a Trump hat, a Trump jersey, a Trump cape and a Trump flag. And here is this guy's explanation as to why Biden is a communist. A weak, 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 communist weak, weak to, to be against a communist, you know. We could fight for America, uh, for American citizens, you know, we could America first. Are you vaccinated? Okay. Um, then we asked people, are they vaccinated? Um, most of them were not. Vaccinated? Uh, I'm half vaccinated. Uh, so you got one dose? I got one dose. So I'm in the healthcare. Are you vaccinated? No, I had COVID and I want my immune system and I'll fast to make that even stronger. Now. I didn't know that you could fast to 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 do something about COVID. Not eating to deal with COVID is I've not heard that before. Absolutely not. And my son's not and nobody is going to be. Yeah. Oh, and then lastly, we go back to this guy who explains why global warming isn't real. And he's talking about something related to planets. Around the sun, one orbit, you know, one, one circle. Right. Every three months we go in, in fly in the universe in a different section. Right. So, so the big uh, orbit, uh, each season the, the Earth fly travel in the universe. Uh, one one four up up the full circle. So each region in the universe is different, right? And how how do you change that? You got to pray to God. I guess what he's saying is there's no global warming because Earth is moving through the universe and climate changes as a result. And all you can really do to control it, I guess, is pray pray to God. So. As bad as anything we imagined, a major success. Great job by Luke Beasley and Josh Pitt and great job by producer Pat putting all of that together. And uh, we're going to do that again. We'll keep sending people to these rallies and um, uh, your your memberships help pay for us being able to do that. We'll let you know when the next rally is upcoming. Well, guys, for better or for worse, Alex Jones is now very, very upset with me. Uh, it's hard to think of a bigger endorsement than Alex Jones thinking what I'm doing is very bad. Alex Jones devoting a uh, a 12 minute segment to me. Now, four minutes was him selling some kind of vitamin. So we're not going to look at that, but at least eight minutes devoted to me, making me out to be a predator of some kind. Let's just jump right into this thing. This is truly beyond belief. Let's take a look. Look at that. That is a frickin' predator right there who thinks he's smarter than you, thinks he's better than you, and he's going to beat you, he thinks. Pac-Man never talked to the New World Order. Pac-Man never got tried to get hired by the Kissinger Group because Pac-Man's a loser. He is it, isn't this the absolute best thing? I mean, it's it's wild. He's a sellout. He's not a real man. And remember, who did I sell out to? They never tell me. He's not a knight at the round table. That's true. I'm not a knight at the round. That that actually is accurate. He didn't actually have a real discussion with the power structure he worships. See, I said no to the evil power structure, not because I was a hero, but because I had God. I had a connection to the infinite. I knew this was a failure. This was not good. I didn't join with God and justice because I was a good person. What? I did it because I had discernment and wanted to be with God. And the still images of me to, so that I that are supposed to, I guess, be ominous are pretty funny. Sam Cedar texted me. Let me tell you exactly what Sam Sam's comment about this was so funny. Um, he said, it's really weird. He does a close up of your face and tries to make you seem evil. But no offense. You look like a teenager from the neighborhood who would carry an old lady's groceries for her home from the supermarket. And yet and yet I'm made out to, to, to look very evil. Now, what's really funny is I don't even know why this 
clip triggered Alex Jones so much. It was one of the voicemails I played where people were saying, do you think if things got bad, you'd be able to get out of the country? For some reason, it really triggered Alex Jones. So this is just a, just a, a snapshot of the bizarreness of acting like a tape call is a call and then nodding with it and talking to it because you're so scared to actually talk to people. Now, understand what Alex Jones is saying. He's saying I'm when you guys know we do a voicemail on every show. When I do a voicemail, I say it's a voicemail. I'm not pretending it's a real call. So Alex Jones is lying to you. That might come as a shock. He also says I don't take live calls on the show. We take a dozen live calls every single week. You I mean, you guys all know that we take live calls all the time. So the entire premise here is a lie. And give them the power of being live. We do it all the time. That's what the left always claims. Jones has fake callers. Jones has fake reviews because they're fake because they rig everything because they're so scared. They got to control it all. We, we, we've been taking live calls every week for a decade. And then to hear, because we can show you the Rasmussen poll. OK, so um, then he continues going into this stuff and then he goes back to the personal attacks, which I have to tell you, I find them funnier than anything else. So they're doing this to us. Classical corporate takeover, censorship, debanking, arrest, tyranny, collapsing. And then he's talking about them as victims. Talk about talk about a fantasy. Talk about a simulation. He's in his own. But he knows it's not a simulation. He loves this for his little groveling followers that actually drink this Kool-Aid. Uh oh, that's an attack on you guys. He's talking about you guys. Continue. Uh, but maybe some people in the audience uh, have a different perspective on the bonus show today. We will talk about the five. Oh, that's enough. Oh, the bonus show where you want to make money. Everybody else that makes money to fund themselves is bad. <laughs> there is no greater endorsement for the bonus show than Alex Jones hating it. Guys, I can't think of a better endorsement of everything we're doing than the fact that Alex Jones hates it. I really can't. If I was telling my children who not to be, it's that guy. I mean, he's a disgrace. And I don't say that like, God, I feel good about myself. No, he makes me feel pathetic. Oh, well, that's interesting. That's, uh, I mean, we should, Alex, if, if seeing me makes him feel pathetic, that would be something to explore in psychotherapy. I think that that would, I think psychoanalysis would have a lot to say about that. Look at those eyes, man. That that's that that dude he is gone, ladies and gentlemen. So anyway, that this is basically just an unbelievable thing. Now, a couple a couple really funny things about this. Number one, I only got two messages in response to this. That's how diminished Alex Jones is right now. In the past, if when he was on real platforms and he would do like a set, you know, eight minute attack video, it would create a frenzy. I got two messages because I don't know that anyone's watching Alex Jones anymore. Secondly, I bet Alex Jones has no memory of the fact that he and I have met in person and we talked for close to a half hour um, at the Talkers New Media seminar some years ago. Alex Jones, me and the, the hosts of Free Talk Live, Ian Freeman and Mark Edge. Uh, Ian now, I believe, is is under arrest. Um, the four of us just had a completely normal conversation about the business of media. And I'm sure he doesn't even remember that. But at the time, he wasn't acting like I gave off predator vibes. He seemed fine chatting with me. And uh, I'm sure if you it probably made no impression on him. I mean, listen, who, who was I to Alex Jones at the time? But uh, just an interesting, interesting little tidbit, but an incredible endorsement. When Alex Jones is this upset with you, uh, you know, you know, that uh, you must be doing something that is resonating with at least some people. So there it is. Um, Alex Jones, very unhappy with me. We'll have clips from this on our Instagram, which you can find at David Pakman show. You can also find the clip on my Instagram at David Don't forget that the best way to support the David Pakman show is by becoming a member, which gives you access to the daily bonus show, the regular show with no commercials. You also get access to our entire archive of every episode dating back a really long time and plenty of other awesome membership perks. Go to joinpacman.com and use the coupon code better 21 for a huge discount. Joinpacman.com. 
Today, we're going to be speaking with David Pepper, who's the former chair of the Ohio Democratic Party, teaches election law at University of Cincinnati Law School, and is also author of the book Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake up call from behind the lines. It's really great having you on, David. Thank you. It's good to be with you. So, uh, yeah, I think maybe to, to start with, there's so many different places where we could look and talk about autocracy, authoritarian tendencies and beyond. Sometimes people talk about voter disenfranchisement and suppression techniques at the state level. We obviously have this big national story of the multi-pronged effort to take an election that they didn't actually win in November of 2020. There, there's all these different things, a uh, control right. of school curricula. I mean, when you look at autocracy, what are the most concerning kind of bullet points that you start with? So I'd say my biggest concern is that we focus on some of the most prominent people like Trump, and, and we should. But my biggest worry is the other side uh, that has, you know, some of the players have been at this for a long time. And while we focus on the high profile people and the things that make a lot of noise and the bright, shiny objects like a Marjorie Taylor Green, they're focused on the institutions that either support democracy or if weakened, could usher in, you know, the lack of democracy or ultimately uh, something that I think is referred to often as competitive autocracy. And the reason I wrote the book is to say, you know, it's it reminds me of the movie Don't Look Up, which I was at first afraid to watch, but then glad I did. It's saying, don't only look at Washington. The institutions that shape our democracy in so many ways are states. One side figured that out a long time ago. They have a minority view that can only survive in a world without robust democracy. So they've had their eye and, and tentacles on the states for a long time, and they're converting them into, as I described, laboratories of autocracy that are nonstop undermining key you know, principles and tenets and protections for democracy, and it's accelerating. And so it's sort of look at the institutions. Don't just look at our usual politics, which is you know federal majorities, one through swing districts and swing states. Look at the institutions that shape democracy. Those are largely state houses. Yes, the federal government can do important things to protect against those. They must. But the heart of it is at the state level. And I just think one side has been blind to that for a generation. The other side has been focused on it like a laser and are scoring victory after victory because of that. So competitive autocracy, competitive authoritarianism, that's a term I've used with my audience before this. This is important to understand. This is that you have at least I say in theory, but maybe some people would say in principle, democratic institutions and electoral competition. But it's not really fair competition. Is that, is that generally the gist of it? Yeah, it's 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 rigging things in advance. It's minority rule locked in with a veneer of legitimacy, with the with the illusion that everything was fair and up for grabs. And, you know, it, it sounds very sort of um, that's that's quite an accusation. But we know where what it looks like. It looks like Hungary. And so we make this accusation. It's not really rebuttable anymore because they're all going to Hungary celebrating it in the wide open. You know, Tucker Carlson, CPAC, Trump, you know, endorsing Orban. They're not hiding that the competitive autocracy system that that, you know, we see in other countries is that what they want when they embrace Hungary. And as I as I go through the book, almost every element that Hungary is going through, rigging legislative elections, suppressing votes in the opposition party, attacking courts, almost every element that Hungary, you know, go through the checklist is going through. You could overlay into state house after state house in our country. It's the same pattern. So it's not like they're only celebrating it in 2022. It's either they've been modeling off of it or just doing the same thing on their own for years. And so, yeah, it's it is what it is the model. And that's why I think one of the reasons I wrote the book is not simply to say, here are the elements of it that we should be concerned about. But we have to move away from doing things that unintentionally legitimize it all. And when we're too silent, when we... When we treat it as politics as normal by applying the by allowing the filibuster to stop us from stopping it, by treating it like any other issue, we play into the, you know, the competitive autocracy end goal, which is 
not only to, to, to sort of suppress democracy, but to make everyone think that it's it actually still is there in, in a viable way. So right, that's the know, key what, point, right? Because yeah, it's, if they people, need to seem legitimate, if people believe it's legitimate, they are less likely to rise up against it. Correct, and it sustains for much longer. You know, again, what is not an effective competitive autocracy? Storming a building. That was not what you do. That was literally. I'm sure Orban was like, um, no, that that does not look legitimate. The key to my success is not openly, you know, trying to overturn an election. It's actually just subtly predetermine outcomes. Everyone votes and you wipe your hand and say, hey, look, election happened. I won again for the 10th time, even though I'm in the minority. So so that's why I think we, you know, it, and some may not like this, but that's why I thought it was good when those Texas legislators left Texas. Mm. They were declaring this illegitimate. You don't normally leave your state. I, I wouldn't recommend that. But if something is so illegitimate that if you just sit there and vote no and it passes, the voters may think, well, that's just politics as normal. It's reaching a point where I think uh, people who are fighting for democracy have to call this out. And that's why, you know, to me, the Senate needs to keep amping it up. Joe Biden can't go silent again. Um, if, if, we, if we have to force Chuck Grassley and uh, Josh Hawley and Cruz to debate for two weeks on end to stop our, our votes to protect democracy. Great. Make them do it because competitive autocracy relies on a sense that it's legitimate and normal. We know it's not, but I think too rarely do we actually act in that way, which is allowing it to continue. So one of the um, discussions that I often have with people who watch my show or with other guests or whoever really is to what extent do you focus on changing the system versus using the system to our advantage? And the prototypical example is the the gerrymandering redistricting, which is right. obviously I would rather and many of the people in my audience would rather a system to prevent gerrymandering to begin with, whether it's a nonpartisan redistricting commission, whatever, whatever the way it is, you prevent the problem. But until that right. happens, is there any choice but to take every opportunity to gerrymander for your side? Because otherwise they're going to gerrymander. H how do you strike this balance? And is, the, is it a, a balance? Great question. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, uh, gerrymandering is bad no matter what. It, 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 I try and show in the book and I go through, you know, so my book, one way to think about it, I do hope everyone gets it because uh, no interview can sort of get into the details. Sure. And, and my, I wrote it to be read and shared because I'm so alarmed. But I, I it's, think of my book as sort of what's the matter with Kansas with a lot of focus on Ohio, but the point is about democracy itself. And I walk through that once you have the non-democratic world of gerrymandering, where no one's accountable, and this is going to be true for anyone who does it, although they do a lot worse than we do. This is not a both sides issue. Yep. Public outcomes crater in these non-democratic rigged state houses, because the incentives that we normally expect on politicians in a democracy, good public outcomes, don't be corrupt. All the account, all the incentives that come with the accountability of the democracy disappear in these rigged systems. So Ohio, under this terribly rigged, non-democratic statehouse, is seeing our, educa our public education fail, our health care outcomes in the low 40s, highest level of student debt in the country. So no one should be stuck in a statehouse with no democracy. It's just bad. But to your point, there's going to be a natural race to the bottom if one side sees one doing it especially on the congressional level. And if they don't do it, then they lose power. And this is why it doesn't have to be either or. This is why the federal legislation that would provide guardrails for everybody is so important. And I want everything there to pass, but, but the legislation in the Freedom to Vote Act would basically come up with some rules about what an unconstitutional gerrymander looks like, I'm sorry, or an illegal gerrymander in the federal law, uh, it may not be deemed unconstitutional, but it could be deemed illegal. That would basically say whether whatever state you are, there are certain rules you have to follow. Or you're violating the law. And the Congress has the right to do that. That's the best way to avoid what you talked about. Change the system, add guardrails, and don't put any state in a position that that it's creating basically a lack of democracy and all the terrible results that come. And by the way, we in Ohio, we did pass two constitutional amendments. Uh, we elected a fair Supreme Court. 
we showed in the last couple of weeks that a court will uphold fair rules uh, if, if you have them in place. And, and that's why the court struck down a really bad map here. Uh, that's a win for democracy, the best in the last generation in Ohio. But it shows that that federal legislation could do the same thing. So there's a way to avoid that, that terrible choice by establishing rules that, that everyone has to follow. Uh, many in our audience understand and uh, are aware of the push to privatization that exists in a number of different areas in, in society. In the book, you talk about how a lot of that is actually happening thanks to state legislatures. Can you yes. give a couple examples of that? Because I think oftentimes the assumption is that it's happening as, as a result of things that politicians in Washington, D.C. are doing. No. The, so the, the, the big private players have figured out over the last 20 years to get the worst, hairiest, most unpopular, and most inconsistent with public outcomes parts of their agenda done, you go to the state houses. That's where you do it because no one's paying attention. These people are rigged so they can never lose their election even when they do really stupid and horrible things. And so examples of that in Ohio, they drain public schools of funding for a generation to give it to for-profit charter school online outfits, some of which have been total scams. And the politicians, even though the schools in their own backyards are, are plummeting and have less money, and the public and the and the private players they've helped who have given them money the whole time have literally turned into scandals, they've only won because of it. They've never lost. So that's a great example. You know, in Ohio we've been draining money, we, the state house, has been pulling money out of local governments for a decade to give it out as tax cuts at the high end. The entire trickle-down theory is in play in almost every state. Again, it would not be sustainable. The shape of small towns and school districts is collapsing. It wouldn't be sustainable in a normal democracy because the results are indefensible. But in this rigged world where they can't lose, these players have figured out you couldn't get it done in Washington. It's too hard. But in and it, it, it get coverage in a way that, that, that would be a problem. Right. But that Betsy DeVos agenda, a state house will do it without thinking twice. And for the most part, no one even knows. And, and, and there are examples all over the country. And in, in, in one of my pieces of advice in my book to anyone running, don't talk about most of what we're talking about right now in your 30 second general election ad. Find the public outcome that is the most horrific. In Kansas, it was the fact that they had school four days a week. Right. And Laura Kelly won on that issue. She could have said anything in the world about Chris Kobach, that a lot of Democrats might have said, we agree. But she was smart enough to say the true issue where I can explain the impact of this corruption and this privatization of everything at the state level and how it impacts public outcomes people care about. The best example is school four days a week. In Texas, it's an energy grid collapsing so that people froze to death a year ago. And Beto O'Rourke is doing a great job right. on that, focusing on that. It's we have to translate the the corrosion of the public asset, public good and the common good is endemic to these broken, privatized state houses. And we have to be smart enough to not just, you know, run around saying the sky is falling, although it arguably is falling quickly, is to say the reason you everyday voters should care about this is your town and your school and your roads and everything else are in worse shape because the Koch brothers have essentially taken over your state house. In the um, in, in the just minute we have left, other than registering to vote and voting in every election where you can vote, what are the, what's the low hanging fruit that people in the audience should be doing? Uh, it's it's go broader and then registering, although that's a very important part of it in states like Georgia and Ohio. Think about your footprint that you have of influence and think about all the ways that you can use that footprint to lift democracy. And it's bigger than you imagine. If, if you're on a, the board of a homeless shelter, is the homeless shelter engaging those it serves or a food bank? Do you know the mayor of a town? Are they registering voters in their rec centers, in their libraries? Scale it up. If you run a small business, is part of your mission of that business lift democracy? And again, it's registration, it's engagement once people are registered, it's early vote. Just think, literally sit down and write down, what's my footprint? And I go through all the details in the book and, and, and engage that footprint as much as you can to lift democracy. And that includes helping people run for state office, state house office, board of education, you name it, registering. 
but use your footprint. Don't wait for Stacey Abrams to save the day or Michelle Obama. Don't just assume people are going to get registered to the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Use the things you do every day to also lift democracy. And that's the way I think we start hitting a scale, especially when we know that every single day the other side is attacking those same voters and right. attacking democracy. So if you're not doing this stuff, we're not just holding steady. We're losing ground in a lot of these states. Without a doubt. Uh, the book is Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake up call from behind the lines. We've been speaking with the book's author, David Pepper. Uh, David, really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Great talking to you. Thanks for all you, all you talk about every day. If you value what we do at The David Pakman Show, remember to support us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash David Pakman Show, where you can get access to behind the scenes videos, the daily bonus show, the commercial free daily show, as well as special discounts on merch, including hats, hoodies, mugs and T-shirts. You can support the show for as little as two dollars a month. Check it out at patreon.com slash David Pakman show. There's some super interesting new polling that I want to talk about, about the 2024 election and specifically about what Republicans are thinking. And the bottom line is Donald Trump's support is rapidly collapsing among Republicans who ultimately will decide is Donald Trump the 2024 Republican nominee or is it going to be someone else? Now, we have seen already in January two pretty sizable rallies and every indication that Donald Trump is going to continue doing more of them in March. He'll be speaking at the uh, Republican National uh, Committee meeting, some kind of mini convention or event in New Orleans, Louisiana. This is a guy who wants to be involved in 2022 and he wants to use 2022 as a way to ultimately have the option to be the nominee in 2024 if he so chooses. Up until now, we've basically been saying the 2024 nomination is Trump's for the taking if he wants it. It's now a question mark, and we're going to look at some recent data, which shows at least some Republicans seem to be getting sick of the guy. And this is a very, very different situation when one where it's Trump's if he wants it. Uh, the Associated Press reporting Trump facing legal and political headwinds as he eyes a comeback. And it references that video we showed you last week where Trump referred to himself on the golf course as the 45th and 47th president, sort of alluding to a 2024 run. Uh, and the article points out his popularity among Republicans is declining somewhat, with 71 percent saying they have a favorable opinion of Trump compared to 78 in September. But the new poll shows only a narrow majority of Republicans, 56 percent, want him to run for president in 2024. The poll found 44 percent do not want him to run. This is a very different situation to what we had throughout most of 2021, particularly the first part of the year. 56 to 44 among Republicans want him to run. That's basically 50 50. Now, of course, that's still fine for winning the primary in the sense that if 56 percent of Republicans support Trump and the other 44 percent support a bunch of other people, some Ron DeSantis, some whoever, right, Mitt Romney, Jeb Bush, Trump still wins with that. But these are dramatically lower numbers than we previously had. Another interesting article in The Washington Post, do Republicans love Donald Trump as they once did, which writes his support within the party may not be quite as robust as it once was. And that is based on a lot of the same polling. This one, though, references a Washington Post University of Maryland survey completed at the end of last year, found that more than six in 10 Republicans say there is evidence of widespread voter fraud. Nearly six in 10 say Biden's election was not legitimate. More Republicans say they want Trump to run again in 2024 than they say want another candidate. But the margins, as we talked about, 50 uh, f down to 54 to 46. And then lastly, there is a Marquette University poll just looking at favorable versus unfavorable on Trump. And if you look now, uh, you see that Trump's favorability is down to only 32 percent. 
67% now have an unfavorable opinion of Donald Trump. Only 32% have a favorable opinion of Trump. So there is going to be a real question here as to whether this guy is actually viable. This is great news. Now, I don't want to praise Republicans for this. I saw some commentaries online saying Republicans are finally coming to their senses. No, they're not. Uh, Republicans are much the same as Donald Trump, where it's what have I heard about recently? And because Donald Trump has been sort of out of the public spotlight for some period of time, uh, I think this is mostly an artifact of that. If there's no real uh, alternative, appealing alternative to Trump, I think it's completely reasonable and even likely uh, that Donald Trump will be back before you know it and and popular. But there's a very interesting kind of uh, intermediate period here where if Trump's role in the 22 midterms is seeing more as a nuisance rather than an advantage. And if some Trumpist candidates lose in 22, which is just nine months from now at this point, and some new Republicans not at all connected to Trump win, it may just move the Republican Party into saying, I don't know, I think we're just kind of beyond Trump. There's nothing moral here where the Republicans have said, we cannot allow this again. That was really bad. It was bad for the country. It was bad for the world. It was embarrassing. This is not about that. This is just a sort of what have you done for me lately? Top of mind type thing. And I think some Republicans are just kind of like, oh, yeah, Trump, that guy. Uh, I don't really know that I want him to run again. And as we saw, um, even from the people we talked to at the Trump rally in Conroe, Texas over the weekend, it's not that these are reasonable Republicans. It's that they just seem to be thinking maybe it's time for somebody else. So we're going to keep watching these numbers really closely. But this is a significant shift away from Trump, at least in recent polling. Dozens of you wrote to me about the neo Nazis openly demonstrating in Florida, in Orlando, Florida. It is absolutely wild what is going on down there. And it's another reminder that, you know, it's it it pains me that among some on the left, uh, Jews are seen as a privileged group that is not a minority targeted by so many different right wing and sometimes, unfortunately, left wingers as well. But we should not allow that to become the dominant perspective among the left because it is just flat out wrong. As officials denounce Nazi rallies in Orlando, DeSantis accuses political opponents of smear. What? Neo Nazi demonstrators in Orlando over the weekend drew bipartisan condemnations, but Governor Ron DeSantis remained silent until Monday afternoon when he responded to questions about the rallies with a tirade against his political enemies rather than against the neo Nazis. So what I'm going to say is these people, these Democrats who are trying to use this as some type of political issue to try to smear me as if I had something to do with that, we're not playing their game. Well, what about denouncing the neo Nazis? He referred to the demonstrators, a group of about 20 shouting anti-Semitic slurs while waving Nazi flags as some jackasses doing this on the street and said they would be held accountable. But he also accused Democrats who called for him to denounce the neo Nazis of exploiting the demonstrations. Now, they just want you to denounce the neo Nazis. It's very simple. Here's some video um, of this bizarre and disgusting event. So that was hail Hitler and what he did. It's, it can be hard to hear. And if you're not watching, there's swastikas everywhere. They're doing the um, Hail Hitler salute as well. They're dressed in sort of like, um, man, is it is it sort of like SS LARPing? Uh, I, I don't I don't know. White power. White power shout there. Six million viewers. <laughs> So six million viewers referring to six million Jews dead in the Holocaust and doing the Heil Hitler salute. White pride is when you think it. White power is when you live it. White pride is when you think it. White power is when you live it. That's another nice little phrase. You can shove that finger up your rabbi's ass. Something about a rabbi. Look at him. Guess where you're going back to? We know you're a Jew. We can tell by how close your eyes are to getting. 
together, you So I think that, wow, uh, that was, you're, we can tell you're a Jew from cl how close together your eyes are. You effing K. So um, this is the United States, folks. This is the United States. And this is not only demonstrations. I think it's important that we remember that this is the sort of cartoonish outburst of it, but that we are continuing to see stories like this one out of Chicago, synagogues vandalized and damaged hours apart in West Rogers Park and Lincolnwood. Multiple synagogues vandalized or damaged just miles apart Sunday in Chicago and Lincolnwood. Someone spray painted graffiti on a synagogue in West Devon. Video shows a hate symbol was spray painted on the backside of the synagogue. Someone spray painted graffiti on a cargo container about a block away. Hours earlier, a man was seen on video kicking out the side window of a synagogue in Lincolnwood. Unclear if the incidents are related. And uh, Alderwoman Deborah Silverstein said vandalism was discovered at several local Jewish institutions and businesses. We want to make sure we stay on top of this because, unfortunately, the, 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 I say this with peace and love. Too many of my progressive brethren, brothers and sisters, um, are not keyed in to the anti-Semitism. They write it off with some very typical sort of philo Semitic tropes that I've talked about before. And um, I don't I don't want to see that. So we're we're going to stay on top of this. Whatever other shows do, I can't tell you, but we're going to be staying on top of this. We have a voicemail number. That number is two one nine two David P. Um, before I play today's voicemail, uh, if anyone in the audience works for Rivian, the electric car maker, uh, please get in touch. Info at David dot com. We have uh, we have an idea. We'd like to talk to someone from from Rivian about. Uh, so if you work at Rivian, the electric car manufacturer, info at David dot com. Here's a voicemail at two one nine two David P. That really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's one of these where someone is projecting onto me something, I guess, from somewhere else, this time about Dr. Fauci. Take a listen to this. David, I'm not really sure why you're still cheerleading Anthony Fauci at this point. Hmm. It's pretty clear from all the news coming out recently that the man is a liar and a proven liar. He clearly knew that this virus came from more than just a natural means. Look into the emails released. They're real. I think he should be fired and he should be ashamed of himself. Uh, he was never a very good person at his position dealing with epidemics or pandemics. Look so listen, first of all, nothing has been proven about the origins of the virus other than what we currently know, which is it seems to have come from animals and jumped to humans. Once if and when we have proof of something other than that, I will talk about it in terms of cheerleading Anthony Fauci. I don't know that you've really seen my show. I don't really care about Dr. Fauci as an individual. What I do know is that the smear campaigns against him and his motives uh, are not based in uh, evidence or fact. And I am a cheerleader for the best empirical knowledge that we have at the time. That's what you can always count on on this program. What do we know? based on actual studies right now, that's what you are going to get from me, not cheerleading of individuals or anything like it. We've got a great bonus show for you today. We will talk about the Joe Rogan response to the Spotify dust up. We're going to talk about the California universal health care bill. It's dead without even a vote. How we'll talk about it. And we will also talk about the fifth New York prosecutor who has now declined to file sexual harassment charges against the former governor, Andrew Cuomo. All of those stories and more on today's bonus show. Sign up at joinpacman.com, get instant access, and I will see you there.
Thanks a lot for watching today's show. I just want to take a second to tell you about today's sponsors. Magic Spoon tastes exactly like your favorite childhood breakfast cereals, but it has no sugar, lots of protein. It's keto and low carb friendly. It's delicious without the guilt. Get $5 off when you click my link below and use the promo code Pacman.